And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Aaron Mate. Thank you. I'm uh, very honored to be here once again. I really appreciate the opportunity. So it has been three years since the alleged chemical attack in Duma and nearly two years since the cover up of the OPCW investigation into Duma was exposed. But yet all this time later, nothing has been done to address the serious flaws in this investigation. So what I want to do today is go through some of the few arguments that have been made by the OPCW and other state parties in trying to justify why they refused to meet with the inspectors, the original inspectors who challenged the cover-up of their probe, and why they refused to investigate any of the scientific fraud that was alleged. So again, what are the basic details of this incident? April 7, 2018, something horrible happens in Duma. Dead bodies are filmed inside of a building. The U.S., Britain, and France, a few days later, bomb Syria, accusing it of committing a chemical attack in Douma. Uh, shortly after that, the OPCW gets a team on the ground for the first time actually having a fact-finding mission uh, reaching the site of an alleged chemical attack in Syria. They investigate. About a year later, in March 2019, a FANA report comes out. And that report claims that there are reasonable grounds to believe that a chlorine attack occurred in Duma. And the inference of the report is that Syria was guilty. So it aligns with the narrative put out by the countries that bombed Syria. But then we get a pretty extraordinary series of leaks that exposes a major deception. And these leaks show that the actual inspectors who went to Duma did not reach the conclusion that was put out by the OPCW. And they actually found that there was no evidence of a chemical attack in Duma. They did not speculate as to what actually happened, but what they said is that there is no evidence of a chemical attack. Uh, we saw that because one of the leaks we got was the original report from the Duma team. They wrote a report that was never released to the public until it was leaked. That report was peer reviewed by the team. It was set for publication, but then something very strange happened. The author of that original report, the chief author, who's been identified by the OPCW as Inspector B. He discovered that someone above him had actually been trying to rush out a bogus report, taking the original report, removing all of the key scientific findings and adding unsupported conclusions, including speculating that chlorine gas was likely used and falsely claiming that there were high concentrations of that chemical. So, Inspector B thwarted the publication of this bogus report because he sent an email of protest that was sent out to all the Duma team members and some officials. That led to the publication of the interim report in early July 2018. The interim report removed the bogus claims of the uh, uh, doctored bogus report, but it also removed some of the key claims of the original report. So it was sort of a compromise. And around that time, something else very curious happened. A U.S. delegation visited the Duma team and tried to lobby them into reaching the conclusion that there was a chlorine attack. Now, it's very common, as we know, for state parties to share information, share views, share intelligence. But a one on one briefing in which the inspectors who are supposed to be protected comes face to face with the U.S. delegation is very unusual. Uh, the first director general of the OPCW, Jose Bustani, told me at the gray zone that he would never have allowed such a meeting to take place. Something else happens around then too. The original team, including uh, Inspector B, who was the chief author of the original report, they are all sidelined. They're taken off the Duma investigation and they're replaced by a so-called core team. Uh, and this is comprised mostly of people who never set foot in Syria. And that is the team that produced the final report. So then we get these leaks showing all this happening. And then what happens? Well, the OPCW refuses to meet with the inspectors. Uh, they uh, refuse to investigate the doctoring of the original report. Uh, the, um, when Jose Bustani, the first director general of the OPCW, when he tries to speak at the UN Security Council when he was invited, certain members, certain member states block him from speaking. And what's interesting about that is Jose Bustani, being the first director general, helped design the protocols used for inspections missions, inspection missions like Duma. He also worked with the key dissenting inspectors because these two inspectors, they're so experienced at the OPCW that their tenure 
coincides with the organization's first leader. And also he has experience in what we're talking about today, which is that putting pressure on the OPCW because when he was the chief, he was forced out by the US because he was standing in the way of the, of the Iraq war. He was trying to bring Iraq into the chemical weapons convention. And he was even physically threatened uh, as he has talked about publicly. And meanwhile, also uh, some deceptive claims are put out in the media about the inspectors. They are disseminated through state funded outlets, including the BBC funded by the UK, and also a website called Bellingcat, which is funded by the US, making false claims about the inspectors and the, uh, and the investigation. So that's what the OPCW's response has been to these allegations. In terms of what they actually say about why they won't address the fraud, they've said very little. But so today I wanna address what little they have said and that is uh, this claim. So the director general has dismissed the inspector's concerns because he argues that they quote, had no involvement in the last six months of the fact-finding mission investigation when most of the analytical work took place. So the first part of the sentence is true. They were not involved in the last six months. That's because uh, Inspector A was sidelined along with the other members of the original team. And Inspector B, his tenure ended in September of 2018, so he was out of the organization. The second, though, part of this sentence is false. And that's when the Director General says that in the last six months, most of the analytical work took place. I want to show you today why that is false. And to uh, glean that, we can uh, learn the facts by comparing the reports. So there's four reports. There's the original report of June 2018. There's the redacted bogus report of June 2018. That's the one where unknown officials tried to replace the original report. There's the interim report that was put out in July 2018 and the final report put out in March 2019. So we compare all of those. The key fact here is that the bulk of the investigation was not conducted in the last six months. If you compare the reports, you will see that the bulk of the investigation was completed within the first two months of the post-deployment investigation, when one of the dissenting inspectors, Inspector B, was still the key figure in overseeing the scientific element of the investigation and authoring the report. So the timeline we're comparing here is the first two months after the team gets back from Syria, that's early May, the two months after that, and then, and then the last six months when the OPCW Director General claims that the bulk of the analytical work was conducted. So first, what do these stats show, of, show us? Uh, they show us that when it comes to the chemical analysis, these are the samples analyzed by the designated laboratories. 70% of the total samples analyzed were analyzed in the first month of the investigation. When it comes to the wood samples analyzed, and this is key because in the attempts to attack the inspectors, there have been false claims made about the wood samples, showing that these wood samples somehow prove the ultimate conclusion. The wood samples, 100% of those wood samples were analyzed in the first month of the investigation. Same thing with biological samples. Uh, interviews, 87% of the interviews conducted and analyzed, these are the witnesses in Syria and also in country X, 87% are conducted and analyzed before the interim report is issued in July 2018. Toxicology. So you have consultation with toxicologists, and there's uh, a few meetings. The original one comes in June 2018. Another meeting comes in September and October of 2018, and we'll revisit the significance of this shortly. Engineering studies on the cylinder. So this is looking at the two gas cylinders that were found at location two and location four. In the original report, a large body of qualitative work was done on the chlorine cylinders. In the final report, three external experts were engaged to conduct modeling studies on the cylinders. Their findings are cited in the report, but we only see a few small extracts. So independent judgment of their work has so far been impossible. Now, there was another study done by Inspector A, uh, who was a member of the original Duma team. He carried this out, uh, also engaging with external experts, but his report was rejected uh, from inclusion in the final report. Analyzing the metadata. So this is analyzing the information contained in photos and videos. 
98.5% of that takes place by June 20th, 2018. The drafting of the report. So comparing the original report by the original team with the final report, I haven't done the exact science, but if you look yourself and compare, most of the original uh, report is contained in the final report. It's just that the key scientific findings that include exculpatory evidence are omitted. Scientific research, so look, comparing the bibliographies, 100% of the scientific articles that were cited in the final report were, were already cited by June 20th, 2018. So basically no new scientific research is conducted. So th those are the stats. What is the significance of all this? What can we learn about the work that was done after the interim report in July, 2018? On the chemical side, only four new samples analyzed from location two after the interim report was issued. Location two is where the dead bodies were found. The only chemicals identified in these samples were one, dichloroacetic acid, which is a chemical found everywhere, such as in the drinking water. Uh, and two, on the chlorine cylinders, there was the element chloride, also very common in the environment. Traces of various other unspecified chemicals known as CLOCs, chlorinated organic compounds, also detected by one of the two designated laboratories. Now, what is the meaning of this? The final report does not argue that the presence of these chemicals provides any evidence for a chlorine gas release, excuse me. These chemicals can come from many sources other than from exposure to chlorine gas. In fact, the report put out just this week by the OPCW IIT, it states that, quote, explanations other than the use of chlorine as a weapon remain possible for the presence of the chlorinated organic compounds in the samples. Now, there also was a very strange delay in the analysis when you look at the timeline. So looking at the original team in the first two months, the first 31 samples, including 11 biological samples, were analyzed by the OPCW's laboratories in under three weeks after the return of the inspectors from Syria. Now to get, to analyze an additional 13 samples, which only included environmental samples, that took a further eight months. So given the importance of this report, why is there an eight month delay in analyzing a further 13 samples? Toxicology. So the toxicologists consulted by the fact-finding mission in June 2018 concluded in unequivocal language that the symptoms observed in the deceased victims were inconsistent with exposure to chlorine and no other obvious candidate chemical causing the symptoms could be identified. This conclusion was suppressed in the final report. And what's interesting is not only was the conclusion suppressed, but even the fact that this meeting occurred was suppressed because if you look at the timeline that is included of the investigation, for some reason, this June 2018 meeting is excluded. The final report states in passing that the toxicologists were consulted in September, to, in September and October 2018. So this is the meeting that is included in September 2018. It doesn't mention, though, what these three toxic, what these toxicologists found, what, they, what the OPCW was told in September and October 2018. In fact, in the final report in evasive language concludes that, quote, it is not currently possible to precisely link the cause of the signs and symptoms to a specific chemical. But this language disingenuously avoids acknowledging that, according to the original toxicologist consulted in June, chlorine was eliminated from the list of possibilities. And the fact that this meeting occurred was also eliminated from the final report's timeline, very oddly. Witness testimonies. Uh, the original interim report, the original report uh, sets out witness testimonies along the lines of two clear and distinct narratives that were gleaned from the analysis of the witness statements. You have witnesses interviewed in Syria and witnesses interviewed in country X. One narrative, which is dominant in the accounts from those interviewed in Syria, is that there was no chemical attack and that the injuries treated in the hospital were due to dust and smoke inhalation. The second narrative dominant in the accounts from those interviewed in country X is that the witnesses experienced a chemical attack. In the final report, these distinctions, these very clear distinctions are blurred 
and the final conclusions only draw on the witness statements coming from those interviewed in Country X. This selective use of evidence is scientifically fraudulent and unethical. It is unclear what, if any, five additional interviews conducted after the interim report added to the analysis. Engineering studies, looking at the cylinders. The suppressed original report has extensive qualitative analysis on the two chlorine cylinders and the relative damage done to them and the surfaces they allegedly made contact with. In particular, the original report raises serious doubts about how the cylinder at location four could have changed trajectory on impacting the bedroom floor and then landing on the bed over three meters away. This is because, as the report says, there are no indications that it made contact with any of the walls or window underneath. So this is this improbable situation where you have a cylinder supposedly dropping vertically through a ceiling and then bouncing off the floor and landing on a bed. A further study coordinated by a senior member of the fact-finding mission team, again, that's Inspector A, one of the dissenting inspectors, raised similar concerns, but this study was rejected by senior management for consideration in the final report. The engineering studies that were considered for the final report are superficial with little by way of engineering data or explanations. The most glaring example, I think, is how the inexplicable bouncing of the cylinder onto the bed was glossed over with nothing more than this claim that, quote, after passing through the ceiling and impacting the floor at lower speed, the cylinder continued, the cylinder continued altered trajectory until reaching the position in which it was found. So bouncing off the floor onto the bed with no visible markings on the walls or the windows. The selective censoring of information. So just to give you an example of how the final report doctored the conclusions of the original report. So this is some, uh, some material here uh, from the original report. And it's talking about how bodies uh, were filmed at location two. And it says that the bodies were moved and repositioned between video recordings. So that word there, repositioned, was removed from the final report. So basically, somebody was manipulating the bodies at the scene, repositioning them. That reference was taken out from the final report. Also taken out from the final report is this entire paragraph in yellow here. Uh, and it includes this line, the fact-finding mission did not obtain any video footage or photos of dead casualties lying in the basement of location two or being removed there. The reason why this is significant is because a number of witnesses claimed that the bodies were, were, were in the basement, even though there was no video of that and no video of those bodies being moved. So conclusions, the bulk of the investigative work, particularly the chemical analysis, witness interviews and analysis, uh, photo and metadata analysis, the report writing, and literature research was completed by early June, the first seven weeks of the investigation, while the dissenting inspector, Inspector B, was still responsible for overseeing the report writing and the scientific work. A large part of the toxicology and engineering studies was already done by the stage as well. No satisfactory explanation has been given for how the minor additional work conducted during the last six months of the investigation would alter the findings of the original report that there was no evidence of a chemical attack. And here we should say too, that even if there is additional work being done after the original team is sidelined, if you are not addressing the alleged fraud that occurred, that only raises the possibility that more fraud took place after that. Now, in particular, the new report does not cite any of the additional analysis results, toxicology, and witness testimonies as new evidence. The only additional evidence is the engineering studies. But as we have seen, these engineering studies are called into question by the work done by the original team and the work done by Inspector A that he oversaw. Apart from not finding any meaningful evidence to conclude that there was a chemical attack, Key evidence contained in the original report that raised serious doubts about a chlorine attack was expunged with no justification from the final report. That key evidence includes toxicology assessments and inconsistencies in witness statements that should have raised doubts about their reliability. And the fact that all this took place should certainly raise doubts about the reliability 
of, of the final report's conclusions. So those are the facts of the work done. Uh, to, again, instead of addressing this, the OPCW has offered excuses. The most recent one we heard yesterday from the Director General Arias, where he was questioned by, uh, as we heard earlier, by two Irish members of parliament, uh, asked a very simple question. Will you meet with the dissenting inspectors? He didn't answer the question. He also said something very interesting. He said, quote, I don't know why this report about Duma was very much contested, which is interesting because he's previously claimed that the inspectors, quote, conclusions are erroneous, uninformed, and wrong. He said that in February 2020. So if you don't know why the report was contested, how can you claim that those contesting it were, quote, erroneous, uninformed, and wrong? But the fact is, the director general does know why this report was contested. If he's managed to ignore all the leaked reports, the statements that have been sent to him, he was what he has not ignored, we know for sure, is a letter from Inspector B that he, Arias replied to in June 2019. And that letter from Inspector B laid out all of his concerns in detail. So it's not true when he says he does not know why this report was contested. So finally, I just want to close and say that the victims in Duma deserve justice. On top of protecting the integrity of the OPCW, of international law, of the uh, word of government who claim that we have to bomb countries based on allegations, the victims in Duma deserve justice. And you cannot claim to care about the victims in Duma if you are supporting the censorship of the investigation into their deaths. Thank you. Now I'd like to give the floor to Aron Mate. Thank you. I want to echo what Colonel Wilkerson said there about <clears throat> there was a lot of discussion today, but very little discussion about the key issue here, which is Duma. And the Ambassador Allen from the UK said that all this has nothing to do with the evidence. He's correct insofar as he's talking about his government's position. There is convincing evidence here of fraud. No one has challenged it. I laid out some of it for you. It's been written about in articles, in statements sent to the OPCW. And Ambassador Allen and the, and the other delegations did not challenge a single fact. While simultaneously claiming that it's us who are trying to undermine the credibility of the OPCW by raising these issues. No, we're actually trying to protect the OPCW from political influence. And the only way to do that is to assure the integrity of the investigation. And there is just a fact that you have dissenters from inside the OPCW, not from any other country, not, uh, not on social media, people who worked at the OPCW raising concerns about this investigation, people who actually went to Syria for this investigation. It's them who are raising the concerns here, and it's them who are trying to protect the integrity of their own investigation. Now, we should add, too, it's not just these two dissenting inspectors that we know about. Hans von Sponek broke some news today when he said that the Berlin Group statement that was delivered to the OPCW was returned to sender. The OPCW would not even accept it. Well, who signed that statement along with Colonel Wilkerson and Hans von Sponek? The first director general of the OPCW, Jose Bustani, and five other former OPCW officials. Are these former OPCW officials the victims of a state disinformation campaign? Are they trying to undermine their own organization? No, they're trying to protect it. And the only way to protect it is to listen to the inspectors. Now, there was some comment made about Sarakib, this new report. I don't wanna to get too much into it because I think the fact is that unless you address the Duma question where scientific fraud is documented, then that raises automatic questions about anything else, including Sarakib, the investigation there. But let's look at Sarakib. If you read the report, it says that it's based on the information that was received from the original OPCW fact-finding mission team that investigated Sarakib. And that initial OPCW fact-finding mission in Sarakib states that they received all samples from one group. That group is called the White Helmets. Who are the White Helmets? They're an, organiza they're an organization funded by some of the belligerents in the Syria war, the US and the UK, which were involved in a war supporting insurgents inside Syria, also funded the White Helmets. The White Helmets also have been working openly with Al-Qaeda-linked groups. There's videos of them taking part in executions. And they were critical to putting out video of a hospital scene in Douma 
that doctors at the hospital scene essentially said was staged because they said the victims there were not treated for a chemical attack, but for, but, but, but for smoke inhalation. So according to this Sarakib report, all samples that they received were obtained from the white helmets, a compromised organization to say the least. Now, what's funny about this is that this violates the OPCW's own stated policies. And I wanna share with you a quote from Michael Lujan, who, is, uh, who was a former OPCW spokesperson speaking back in 2013. This is what he says. The OPCW would never get involved in testing samples that our own inspectors don't gather in the field because we need to maintain chain of custody of samples from the field to the lab to ensure their integrity. That is the OPCW spokesperson in 2013. So according to the OPCW's own spokesperson and own policies, the chain of custody in Sarakib was violated, which raises another issue to at least be skeptical of it, along with the unaddressed fraud in the Doom investigation. So on that point, I wanna ask a direct question to the ambassador from the US, Ambassador Mills, and Ambassador Allen of the UK. There is a proposal now from Hans von Sponek that he said before for this matter, the Duma fraud, to be taken up by the OPCW's scientific advisory board, its own scientific advisory board, not Russia's China uh, advisory board or China's, the OPCW's own scientific advisory board. The proposal is for that board to look at the Duma evidence and to meet with the inspectors on the original team. Will you support that proposal? And if you don't, please explain why. I'd love to hear an answer to that today. Thank you. And I also noticed that uh, Mr. Matei addressed uh, directly, uh, personally to Ambassador Mills and to Ambassador Allen. Uh, since they are not here, I, I, I promise, I commit that uh, we will ask that question that you posed, Mr. Matei. I'm sorry, they have left the meeting, so they can't answer my question? Uh, they, they are not at the meeting personally. So since that was a personal question, we will address that, uh, that question to them personally, to their delegations, and we will ask them to provide their, their answer on it. I, I they're not here. Sorry, yes. Uh, 